How's it going today, guys? Um, so, if you guys attended uh, the earlier session at 9 this morning about Crypto Wall, uh, you're going to be familiar with some of the topics that we're going to cover today. Um, so, welcome to the presentation. Uh, I'm Ryan Dillette. I currently run security operations for a company called Carbon Black. They're local in Boston. They do endpoint security. Um, as a disclaimer, some of the slides in here do have uh, snippets of our product in it, um, but it's not marketing, I promise. Uh, marketing, HR, and sales has never seen this, as you'll soon find out. Uh, <laughs> um, today I'm going to talk about how uh, attackers, particularly around the ransomware variants, are abusing uh, legitimately signed Microsoft binaries and how to defend your enterprise against these types of attacks uh, using free and open source stuff that you can replicate uh, in any of your environments. Um, I'll go over quickly, uh, you know, who I am, what I've been doing, and uh, a high level of the topic. Um, I can kind of assume that the majority of you in here know what ransomware is, at least at a conceptual level, uh, so we can just skim through all that. Um, so, once again, I'm Ryan Nolette. For the past 15 years, I've been doing uh, incident response, forensics, threat intel, uh, and most recently, more and more security operations focused stuff. Um, currently, I, I handle basically the day-to-day -day operations of the SOC, handle our, our analysts, um, going through the compliance, doing security oversight, all that good stuff. Um, I have a very long list of things I'm responsible for, but they can all get summed up pretty quickly. Um, but basically, uh, any of you who work in SecOps know this feeling. Um, you just, we might as well be called uh, waste management, really. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so what's ransomware? Well, if you type that question into Google, you get a definition of a particular piece of software that's designed to block access to a computer system until a sum of money is paid. Uh, I can't really argue with that definition. It's not mine. Um, I don't really think there is much room to argue. But when it comes down to it, what can ransomware actually do to your system? Uh, it does a ton of things. Um, a short list of them up here. The most common are encrypting your files, and not allowing you to use your system without paying the ransom. There's also um, the Scareware ransomware, which just has a pop-up that um, it just downloaded terrible things to your system, and it'll tell the cops about it if you don't pay. Uh, but by far and away, the most devious and evil thing I've ever seen ransomware do uh, is make you complete surveys. <laughs> and I would like to find out where that guy lives, because that... That sucked. It took me 20 minutes to get through the survey so I could finish executing the ransomware in my lab. <laughs> you can't automate that. <laughs> so what's vShadow? Uh, vShadow is a command line tool that uh, Microsoft created to allow you to create and manage volume shadow copies. A shadow copy is technology that's included um, that allows taking the backup copies of computer files or an entire volumes on the system. Uh, these backups can be taken even when files are in use, which adds to a whole bunch of use cases for this, because you don't actually have to stop anything in order to start messing around with shadow copies. Um, it's implemented in Windows as a service called the Volume Shadow Copy Service, or VSS. So throughout the presentation, you're going to hear a couple of terms. Um, they all kind of mean the same thing. VSS, VSS Admin, VShadow, Volume Shadow Copy. Um, I'm just going to stick them in a shotgun and point it, and you're going to get one of them, but they all relate to the same concept. They just are names of different aspects of the same tool. Um, I, I can see from some of your expressions uh, that you know why this is a bad thing, right? This is a legitimately signed Microsoft binary that exists on your system already that when we abuse it doesn't raise any flags, right, from your normal detection sources. So let's, uh, let's break something, right? So what, what I'm going to show you guys is actually how to do this attack. Um, I cut out a few things. There's one or two steps missing in there, and I'm not telling you how to get onto the system because I'm not liable for the terrible things or pranks you will do with this. Um, there's my caveat and liability gone. So... Some variants of the Crypto Locker family. Um, particularly, I'm going to talk about Crypto Locker version 1 and its variants. And by variants, I mean their minor revisions. There's well, probably thousands of different variants at this point. There's 
you know, um, of ransomware in general, the Locky, the crypto wall, the crypto locker, all this stuff. And at a conceptual level, they're the same idea, right? They lock your shit down and they don't let you use it until you pay them. Um, we're going to focus on one because you only have like 40 minutes to talk about it. Um, so if you guys want to talk about the newer stuff, I'm sure I can find beer somewhere and we'll go through it. So the technique that I'm going to show you uh, is what I've seen most recently uh, with these minor variants. And it's being utilized to avoid detection and for uh, something called anti-forensics or anti-analysis, depending on who you're talking to for terminology. The technique consists of uh, dropping your malware onto the file system via whatever mechanism you choose. Uh, the second step is creating a volume shadow copy, then mounting the volume shadow copy, dropping the malware on it, executing the malware, and then unmounting and deleting the shadow. Uh, what's very unique about this technique is that even after unmounting and deleting of the shadow, the malware's still running. So what we're really doing is we're taking away all the file system artifacts that existed from the attack and having it still run. That will really piss off your AV vendor. <laughs> so on uh, Windows XP, the VSS admin tool doesn't exist um, natively. Uh, later on, Microsoft supplied a, a patch that would add it to there, but basically Windows Vista and up have uh, built into the SDK the VSS admin executable. Uh, once the volume, oh, sorry, once the shadow copy ends up getting uh, executed on the system, the attacker uses it to create persistent shadows. What we're going to work with here is persistence as defined by survives between reboots. So there's different forms of persistence, there's different definitions of it depending on your use case and whatnot. I'm very specifically talking about you can reboot the system and the malware remains and will run again. Um, so for this, we're going to create this persistent shadow by uh, having the dash P option. P for persistence, C for cookie, whatever you like to have uh, to remember it. So we're going to point this towards the location on the file system of where we want to create the shadow. What we're doing here is we're creating the shadow of the full C drive, the entire volume. Uh, and what this is doing is it's allowing us to drop files into basically a file system that doesn't exist yet will mirror your active file system. Um, in the example, what's going to happen when we kick off the the initial vShadow executable with these options, it takes a few seconds to run. And what you see is the second output here that I have highlighted uh, in red. Um, the thing I want you to pay attention to is the ending name of it, because that's what it's going to be referred to in the further attacks, not that this is you know, something you have to memorize, like cd dot dot means go back. It's just what one we're going to use um, I probably could have named it something easier like Batman, but I didn't think of it at the time. Um, so going into the actual attack, uh, we created a shadow, it's persistent, it's there on the system. Well, you have to mount it. So what we're going to do is we're going to use this mlink command to create a symbolic link, uh, which is very commonly done in Linux. Uh, you can also do it in Windows. Uh, here the attackers are creating the link in the system32 directory and what we did is we created another directory under it called msdc. Um, what we're doing is we're pointing the shadow into that directory. So that new virtual file system that we just created a minute ago now exists in sys32 slash msdc slash volume shadow. Um, and everything that's under all the child directories, all the child processes, everything like that now exists in that one folder. Um, the malware itself, after this is mounted, is dropped in slash C of the volume shadow. So you dropped it in the root of it. Yet, when you look at the system, as you can see from the directory listing that we did, that malware isn't in slash C. It's in sys32 slash msdc slash malware.exe. Um, that's not real malware, that's command.exe that I renamed. Um, just to show you that any binary can be used for this. Um, so when you actually do a file listing of this, you're not seeing anything weird or funky. You're seeing a path that looks pretty legitimate. 
if you saw a path in Sys 32 with a directory named MSDC during your initial analysis of a system, would that make the top of your list or would that fall towards the bottom of something that could be legitimate and I'll come back to it to look at it if nothing else pops up? You know, for most of the time, you're looking for really weird things, randomly generated file names, uh, some of the stuff that you'll see in a minute happening. But this adds in a little bit of the, not anti-forensics, but forensic deterrence, right? They're making it harder for the investigators to find it by making themselves mimic the native tools, the native directories, the native paths. They're trying to hide themselves by living off the land, so to speak. So once the sim link's been created, and the contents of the shadow copy are accessible via any normal means, so you can use your command prompt to get to it, you can use File Explorer, um, any batch script you write, any, anything really, um, can now interact with this file as if it existed on your actual file system. Oh yeah, that's not connected. Uh, <laughs> once the file system's in place, the malware started just like any other executable. Um, you know, choose your weapon, so to speak. When the malware started, um, you can look at it in a tool like Process Explorer. I used, um, you know, Task Manager for this uh, to make it to just basically look at what it's doing. And we can see that the malware isn't running out of the root C directory where we actually dropped it. It's running out of this MSDC directory because it's linked to it. And this is how the file system is actually representing the location of this malware now. Uh, so the path doesn't really look that suspicious. And when you're looking for it in your normal tools, uh, if I didn't have this named malware.exe, you probably wouldn't do a second glance at it. So once the malware started, the attacker can unmount and delete the shadow, and the malware will continue to run. Um, up here, you can see that I have uh, this directory, the MSDC. I go in and I delete the shadow copy. There's unmount commands and stuff, but you know I like to break things, so I just didn't bother unmounting properly. Uh, my USB would yell at me. But the same kind of idea is here. I just delete the shadow copy, say yes to it. But even after that, our malware is still running. So now what we see is it's a hiding mechanism and there's anti-forensics thrown in because now you've removed file system artifacts that didn't really exist to begin with. So how do you find it and detect it? How are you going to end up finding this malware running on a system in your environment if most of your tools are file-based security tools and file-based um, sorry, file system based visibility. There's no registry values for this at the moment. There's no new files. There's not even uh, temp files or metadata associated with it. Uh, everything has been deleted, and unless you're watching everything in real time uh, and actually have this logged out to somewhere else, you won't even see these commands that happened, and your virus scanner won't detect them happening because it only scans in increments. So basically, your security tools have missed this completely, and we just did it in three seconds uh, that you can do with a script. Surprise! <laughs> you know, I, uh, I like to end those sad notes with very happy things. Um, normally I dance, but um, no. <laughs> so, um, so visibility, right? The, that's the main thing we're talking about uh, for the rest of the presentation. Um, you, you see basically how the attack was, was outlined and how it was executed. Uh, all this can be done from a script, uh, so there's really nothing uh, fancy or secret about it. But what's you know, more difficult and more interesting is how are we going to actually find this happening and then how are we going to stop it from happening? So we're going to do a couple things here. First and foremost, um, let's talk about the things that we can see. When I do any kind of uh, malware investigation, I like to bucket things into two big buckets, visibility and accountability. If you can't see it, you can't account for it, you can't say who did what and when, right? If you're trying to do a forensic timeline or an IR, it's one of your you know, critical tasks. You have to show timelining. What happened over time? What was the scope of it? All, all this really boring paperwork. But what's really important about it is it also finds those gaps you have in your security already. And it's really about adding more and more visibility until you slowly but surely kind of tie a fence around the accountability, right? You find those gaps and you start trying to detect things. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over this from two points of view. 
Um, what's it look like from the host point of view? So using only native tools on the system, what can we find? And then the second one is um, I have two slides with an IR tool, um, which is the carbon black one, uh, because it's free. I don't have to pay for it, and it makes some very nice, pretty pictures. Um, but I'm going to show these two techniques. After that, I'm going to go into how to actually block this from happening using only native tools that if you have a Windows environment, you already own these tools and have them fully licensed. So, um, so you don't have to memorize this. I know there's a crap ton of info, um, but I'm going to quiz you all later. And uh, since we detonated this malware on purpose, right, we have this short list. We don't really have that luxury in the real world, right? You're not going to have a list of, uh, you know, IOX and things like that square off the bat. Um, you'll be lucky if you have a basic alert when this thing tried to beacon home or, or talk about something. Um, to make this workflow a bit more realistic, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create what I call watch lists, um, which are basic things that I have for monitoring on my local system um, that happen in real time. So as this event goes off, I know about it. Think of it as, you know, like a, I think the like a like a tripwire or um, uh, any other kind of automated script you have running that'll tell you if file systems changed, um, hashing, anything like that. Basically, tell me when this behavior or event occurs. Uh, so what I'm going to look for is uh, conditions that occur if VSS admin was executed from the command line or from a batch script. So. Let's do it from the, uh, the IR tool. So once again, it does pretty pictures. Uh, what's interesting about the malware that I executed, so when I did this full attack, I ended up using uh, a, cop a copy of CryptoLocker that I got from you know, malware.com, right? I just pulled it down and I executed it and I wanted to see what happened. The file that I pulled down ended up having um, some kind of extension obfuscation. What it represented itself as is a PDF file, yet we know, uh, unfortunately, it cut off the really long hash name of it, um, that even though it's showing itself as a PDF, it's actually an executable. So when you try to read that PDF on your system, it opens up um, a couple of child processes and starts spawning off things to look at. Um, based on the alert, you know, alone, a PDF is, uh, an executable is hiding itself as a PDF is a warning flag and something you should investigate. But the fact that a PDF is spawning off child processes gives you even more worry to look at. So let's go up the tree and kind of look at what the originating file was. So the originating file is that has this really long hash number and that's because I pulled it down off you know, a place that's a malware database um, and that's how they store them all is by hashes. But the icons that it shows itself is something to give us a warning. But also the hash when I go look it up, it, it's like a 43 out of 56 score, right? That's probably something you should look at um, and, and check out in your environment. But if we break it down to what are the things that actually did on the system, uh, it spawned three new child processes, which then spawned grandchild processes, great-grandchild processes, all the way down to do its dirty work throughout the system. Um, it ended up creating four new registry values. And from these registry values, we can infer that it is doing extra persistence mechanisms on your system. It's adding registry values to the run once and run um, registry keys, so that way it can try to execute itself on boot and at login, which is a common uh, persistence mechanism. And then it also created 10 new files on the system. Um, you'll, you can see them in the different paths, but I'll talk about them a little more in the next section that actually details the full file path in and how it's hiding the persistence mechanisms. Um, based on our findings, you know, you can tell pretty well easily that you're owned, right? And you basically need to re-image at this point. So how do we go through the manual process of detecting this and then removing these files, having only tools that's on, you know, your grandmother's computer? You know, I'm not talking about in the enterprise when you can pay for a half million dollar technology. I'm talking about, you know, your grandma calls you up that her system has a weird red pop-up on it. Can you help her out? And that's what we're going to go into. The hunting native. So what happens on the host point of view? Well, 
what we can see is we can do some timestamp mapping. So up here at the top, I have a, a little PowerShell snippet um, because batch scripting is weird. And if you try to do this in batch script, you actually have to um, say, show me all files modified in a certain time, then show me all files modified within a different set of time, and then do a diff between the two, and that's what you get left with. Uh, that's confusing, that's annoying, so PowerShell, very straightforward. Um, and what this is doing is basically looking for, tell me all files that were created on the system in the last 24 hours. So uh, how many people here have done some kind of malware reverse engineering or IR stuff? So you guys know malware changes its timestamps, right? Um, it usually changes its modified timestamp, but it's really rare for it to change its creation timestamp for automated attacks for very specific campaigns or specific targeted attacks. Yeah, it'll change everything it possibly can. But in this case, since it was all automated, we can depend pretty well on the creation time for this detection. And what I've done is I basically I ran the script and I got a list of tell me every single file that was created in this time frame. When it was created, I was then either able to just parse through the list and look for what, a ran what looks like a randomly generated file name and out of a location where a, uh, a new binary shouldn't have been created. So we have a brand new binary that looks pretty randomly generated in your roaming directory from app data. Um, for those of you who have worked with you know, Trojans before, Zeus, SpyEye, um, this is where all of the Trojans drop their executables or in a child directory of this directory. It's extremely common uh, to the point where this is one of the first places I look on a system if I'm trying to see if it's owned. Um, there's a couple other directories I'm going to show you that I look at that are the first places I look for. So now that we've found this thread, right, we found one thing that looks kind of weird. Let, let's pull on it a bit and see where it takes us. I keep thinking this is plugged in. <laughs> uh, while in the process of researching ways of trying to find these detections, um, I was thinking about how can I create my own little tool to end up basically being my virus total check, right? Uh, virus total is a database of hashes that associated good and bad known files. Um, and basically every AV vendor uh, has an engine up there, at least all, all the most prominent ones. So you can actually see if any of them have a signature for the file that you're working with. Um, what's nice is they have an API so I can use Python just to toss the file up or check the hash and it returns a bunch of data for me. In this case, what I did is um, I found out that Windows actually has a native hashing tool that I had no idea existed. I've always used a third party tool to do it. Um, but this command up here was very useful for me. Um, it's just a cert util command and you, um, I threw this in a script and I went through all those files that I found in the last PowerShell so I just put those two things together. So for every file that was created in the last 24 hours, hash it and then drop it into my virus total check, goes out and checks the hash, comes back with the score and tells me those things and prints me out a nice pretty CSV. Um, it, your return doesn't look like the nice virus total picture, but <laughs> CSV is not that pretty <laughs> to put up. Um, so. Once again, we can see off this check, you know, using just native tools that are already installed on your system, that this has a score of 44 out of 56 in virus total and it's on your system. We should look at it. But let's look at some other associated things, right? We have the creation timestamp of this file now. Well, if this was done through a script, there should be other created files within a very short time frame around it because it's all automated. So let's start looking for those. So next up, we find that created at roughly the same time is a file actually by the same name. This isn't always true with the same name, but in this case it was. Created at pretty much the exact same timestamp in your start menu program startup folder. This is the second place I commonly look because this has been a persistence location for, uh, I don't know, the past two or three years. Um, at least with the CryptoLocker variants that I've been working with. So the first place I check is app data, looking local, local, low, and roaming. And then I come over to the um, startup directory. This is where applications that start on uh, login are. So things like if you want your Outlook 
to start at login, it drops a, uh, basically a redirect link in here, and now Outlook starts when you log into your system. So uh, next up, going through the, the timestamps again, um, I'm able to find uh, a hidden directory, actually, at the root C dire directory, which, once again, is named the same thing. Um, I'm starting to think, you know, this author doesn't have much imagination. They should have picked better names, but um, I'm going off timestamps at this point in time, and I find yet another thing. So I end up doing um, a search for all hidden in this directory uh, to end up finding this and get some more information about it. Uh, inside this directory is actually another binary by the same name, which is the exact same hash as the stuff we've been finding. So if for those of you who are counting, that's three new binaries that it's done in different uh, places. Uh, it's in your roaming directory, which is the primary one it's working off of. It's in your startup directory, which is a known persistence mechanism. And then if you found both of those, it created a hidden directory and threw the binary in there as well. All right? And the best part is, after it does this, it then deletes the originating binary from where you downloaded it to. So it's trying to hide its tracks. So if we look in this hidden directory, we find, once again, that binary, that's the exact same thing. The author is very much afraid of this being found. So they're creating backup plans for their backup plans for their backup plans. And I, for one, feel that that kind of paranoia is not healthy. And they should really talk to someone about it. So talking about those persistence mechanisms, Something that you're not really able to search for is that timestamping. But because we did the original timestamp search first, we're able to know file names so and full file paths. So now we can search the registry for those file names and file paths to find more associated artifacts. So if we search through it, um, we can actually find some things. These are in the run and run once, uh, which are... Um, the, the registry keys that are used for when things boot, uh, sorry, when applications launch either at boot or login. Um, I can't remember which one's which. Uh, I think run is for a regular login and run once is for safe mode or it's the other way around. Uh, if anybody knows, shout it out. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head. Uh, but what I can infer from these being in existence is that once again, the attacker is aiming for more and more mechanism for persistence. They're trying to get more ways on there. They're making it harder for them to be removed from the system. Um, uh, next up, <laughs> uh, if you're after this stuff is run, well, you can start to see a list. So there's a registry uh, value called CryptoLocker. For other malware, this doesn't exist, but in this case, uh, this is a list of everything that's encrypted uh, right in your registry. I refer to this as the pissed list because the more you read it, the angrier you get. And if this ends up on your executive's machine, you have a real problem, right? Uh, this is not a happy person to deal with. No, no, just soak it in, really. <laughs> that's... <laughs> Originally, I had the gif of uh, Steve Ballmer and Bill Gates doing the dance with the huge shoulder pads, but, you know, this one wins. <laughs> um, so, how do we detect this attack? Um, how do we avoid um, the whining exec um, that's really upset? Uh, so, let's, let's talk about it a bit. Um, we're we're going to stick to different kinds of indicators here. So, I broke it into two categories. Right? There's IOX, which are, I consider, static um, kind of indicators. So things like hashes, file names, registry values, uh, even full paths, and network connections. Uh, I consider those static. The IP addresses and domain names are not static, so I group those into the behaviors category. Because, uh, any of you familiar with DGA? Um, Trojans have domain generating an algorithm uh, so an, an author will basically register a couple thousand domains uh, based off an algorithm and the algorithm is put into the actual code so depending on some kind of factors and some fancy math it knows which domain name to reach out to and all these domain names redirect to one single CNC host right um 
Sorry, somebody out there's name is Ryan, and so is mine, so every time somebody says it, I kind of twitch. Um, so so I'm, uh, I'm sticking to indicators that um, you can use in other tools, right? Uh, not just the, the fancy ones that I have, but uh, pretty much any kind of IR tool. So these hashes, uh, which is not a full list, uh, they constantly update these and the hash changes. Um, but to give you an example, here's the hashes that I pulled off of MSDN for uh, Windows 7, 8, and 8.1, uh, even Vista, uh, you know, that, that are 32-bit and 64-bit. And then what I did is I took them and I threw them into whatever IR tool I had at the time. You could do this search uh, manually if you really want. You can do a PowerShell script to do it. Um, but I, I just threw it into my script. So, um, you know, process MD5 is that hash. And then you see an OR statement at the end because originally I had them all on there, but space. Uh, and I forgot to delete the OR. <laughs> um, so you can grab these indicators and start searching for them uh, in your tools. Um, these hashes are specifically for the SDK versions of vShadow. So these are the ones that are not natively on your system. So if you find these and it's not a developer, mm, that's a bad sign because you know your marketing guy is not going to install copies of vShadow to look at Salesforce. Or if he does, I want to talk to him because that dude's a genius. <laughs> Um, so let, let's take a little bit closer look at the, uh, the vshadow.exe process. Um, one of the attributes that we're looking for is unique characteristics, right? How do you choose between a legitimate execution of vshadow and an illegitimate use of it? Well, here we can see that uh, parent processes would be something like, you know, command.exe. So if you see command.exe run, you know that either somebody manually typed that in their command prompt or a batch file did it, right? Because it runs under the same uh, parent process. In this case, I'm looking for very specific things, such as the VSS uh, underscore PSDLL, which is loaded only for vShadow. So I can narrow this down to, if I look for this DLL being loaded, I know that vShadow was executed and was executed out of a script. So. I ended up uh, writing these queries down here, which basically look for um, the detection of the loading of the DSL. Uh, sorry, not the DSL, the DLL, um, because that's faster than DSL. And uh, <laughs> you gotta laugh or you'll cry. Uh, so once this loads up, uh, we also look for a command line argument of dash P for that persistence. So this was the initial step that I showed you guys in the attack. We're now looking for that happening in real time on the system. Um, below that, we're looking for the make link command. This is the attacker interacting with the shadow copy. It's the second stage of the attack, right? We can look for that as well. Uh, or you can look just for vshadow being run uh, with, those, uh, with those commands at the end of it. What we're really trying to do is basically narrow down the script and rule out the false positives. Um, I have a, about 3,000 hosts that I can throw this stuff into, um, so I can only I can detect a lot of false positives, but uh, your environments may vary um, depending on your users and what access they have to things. In this case, um, I only had one false positive, and that was for something called wearefault.exe. Um, it's a Windows process. Uh, off the top of my head, I can't remember what it does, but it it apparently interacts with vShadow. Um, I don't know why, <laughs> uh, but it does. Uh, one caveat that I found is um, the make link command is a function of command.exe. So depending on what tool you use, you need to make sure your tool has the ability to see command line arguments, not just the commands issued. Or else um, now you have a bunch of gaps and your query is a lot broader. You're either going to have false positives or you're going to have collateral damage depending on your command. So uh, once again, we go back to this name of this... Uh, this um, shadow. So what we're doing is we're looking for a random process that is talking with this. But we can actually cut this down a whole bunch. We can just look for these shadow copies being created, right? Um, if you see these new volumes created on your system, I mean, they are most likely not legitimate because most users don't interact with shadow copies. Most of them don't even enable this on the system. 
So unless this is enabled at the GPO level by your admins, this is not a normal event in your environment. And this is another unique characteristic that you can look for in order to detect this attack. You can also look for processes running out of that path, uh, which would tell you that something terrible is happening as well. Um, so I know I have a couple minutes left, so I'm going to buzz through the last portion of this, which I think is probably the most important. How do you block this, right? Let's, we've gone through the attack, we've gone through the, you know, all the legwork, um, we've gone through a couple different ways to detect it, there's a million other ways to do this, but in this case, let's block this with tools that you guys have in your environment already, right? Uh, so, with any ransomware, the, the two main things come up. Make sure you have good backups and train your users not to do terrible things. Um, one is easier than the other, and both of them are backups. <laughs> uh, so, this is how I end up restoring previous versions of files. Um, there's ways to do it programmatically, but um, what I liked this is that it's accessible on pretty much every Windows system, right? When you go onto that system, you're gonna have this console. It might not be populated with anything, um, and the copies might not be the most recent. Um, they may help you, and I use may dripping with hope that these could be restored and be usable for you, uh, but it's not really something that you should depend on. So, you know, the offsite backups and things like that are important. That's all the proactive stuff, and that doesn't have much to do with the actual blocking that we're about to do, but it's good to remember anything you can do proactively is going to save you a lot of time uh, doing this in your environment. So um, one of the things that I'm going to show you guys is whitelisting. Um, and this isn't whitelisting like my company's whitelisting product, so don't let marketing hear you. Uh, we're going to use a free tool uh, that's available from Microsoft. Once again, don't let my marketing team hear you. Uh, and um, the reason why we're looking at whitelisting for this is um, think of the the malware like a, you know like an arrow or you know how about like a basketball and uh, whitelisting is basically you know shot blocking right um, and the malware author is this little kid and we want to crush his spirit we don't just want to win we want to make him cry so how are we going to do this the, the more you watch it the better it gets isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Now, I got this on like a little window on my side and I can't, I can't actually look over to my notes, like I can't look away. Um, so let's, uh, let's block this stuff in your environment. We're going to leverage uh, three pillars of uh, good IT work, right? We're gonna leverage GPO, witchcraft, and cursing because we're about to deal with the most complex and uh, complex is the most polite word I can use uh, example, and that is we're going to start touching GPO. Uh, so what we're going to use here is Microsoft's tool AppLocker. Um, of course, once again, proactive, don't click on suspicious links, Zelda is upset. And for any of you that think that's Zelda on the screen, I will slap you. <laughs> All right, that is definitely a link. Um, anyways, uh, what we're going to do here is we're taking some of that info that we found earlier, right? Uh, so we did that initial query show me all the files that were created in 24 hours. I went and I hashed them. I found on virus total hits for them. I know these are bad files and I know these are in these locations, right? These are all things that we have discovered and we have confirmed through this information. So let's use these to build these proactive detections and blocks, well, which is the more important thing. So what we're going to do is we're going to create software restriction policies. Um, you can use, uh, you can do this on a single computer using the local security policy editor. So you can do that at your house, your grandma's computer, whatever. But if you have a domain, you're going to end up using group policy editor in order to supply this for your entire enterprise. Uh, a fun fact that I learned um, after initially doing all this research uh, and ways to do this is that I found out that AppLocker actually has an option excuse me, to enforce DLL blocking as well. I didn't know that. Um, I just found that out. Um, and then I tried doing it without reading any of the documentation around it. This will destroy all the performance on your endpoint, um, basically. It, it's very effective, 
but it monitors every single uh, execution of the DLL. Um, so it's going to dramatically decrease performance. Um, and I don't have to show you the picture of the exec again, right? That's what's going to end up happening. Um, so what we're going to stick to is just the binaries here. So uh, first thing we're doing is we're, we're opening up the security policy editor. This is kind of what it looks like. Um, and through a couple of clicks, you're able to create the policy on your system just like that. Five clicks, you populate it with your path. Here I use uh, a wildcard. Um, wildcards are, are fun and easy, uh, but they come with collateral damage, right? Um, when you're, when you're going to evaluate you know, whitelisting tools, you might want to look for ones that have extra conditions involved in them, like trust ratings, prevalence, um, other useful things. Because if you're doing just plain whitelisting, um, that's like trying to open a pickle jar with a sledgehammer. Um, you're going to get it open, but you're going to break shit everywhere. Um, and for example, here, um, we're, we're, we are going to block one of the initial infection uh, vectors, but we're also going to end up blocking Spotify, uh, Firefox, Chrome, and any other uh, application that I would consider poorly coded because they're executing binaries out of app data where config files should be not binaries. Um, so that's my grievance. I've aired it. Uh, but here, um, you're going to have to create exceptions depending on your environment if you're going to do this. Or look for a tool that has those extra conditions that you can add to your whitelisting uh, so you can get around that and end up not blocking legitimate files. Um, lastly, you know, here's the final product. Um, you've now blocked CryptoLocker from installing on your computer. Uh, but you've also stopped Zeus and SpyEye and a uh, TidServe uh, and a whole bunch of other uh, genres that were built off of the Zeus source code um, that went, you know, that went open source years ago. Uh, so a lot of malware reuses the same code, so you reuse the same directories. Uh, once again, you will have collateral damage, um, so make sure you create those exceptions. Because um, I love my Spotify, and I'll be very upset if you block it on me. Um, in closing, uh, ransomware is really annoyingly effective, right? Uh, the recent additional features of removing shadow copies make it even more dangerous because when you can no longer restore from backup, you are at the attacker's mercy, right? And your options are pretty slim at that point. Um, regardless of what security products you use, um, your best defense for any of these attacks is user training and good backups. Um, even if you don't get hit by ransomware, you get hit by some other variant. Rather than having to completely re-image and rebuild the system, you can restore it for, for to a gold image and put your backups, uh, restore your backups to it, and have all your data working again. So anything preventative that you can do proactively is uh, is really going to help you out in the long run. Um, so thank you for your time today, and uh, remember my motto: flag it, tag it, and bag it. Also known as the double tap uh, for any of the malware that you do. Uh, questions. Once again, HR has not seen these. This used to have a lot more GIFs in it. Um, but when you try and submit like a 50 meg PowerPoint, they start asking questions and they don't want to open it. So <laughs> then we went to static pictures. Yeah? What are the limitations of the detection approaches that uh, you cover in the What do you think are the shortcomings of malware authors can exploit? There, there's quite a few. Um, so the, the real purpose of this method of detection is living off the land. Um, so the tools that are natively installed on your Microsoft system already. Um, and because of that, you have the limitations of those tools. They were not designed for hunting malware. Um, so they don't have a lot of options. And also, um, if you're trying to do some kind of forensic investigation, these will modify things on your system. Therefore, your forensic timeline will be off and you will end up running into issues when people talk about your gold image and whatnot. So if you're going to do this stuff on a known affected machine and you can only use Windows tools, make a copy of the system and then run these tools against that copy so you don't mess up the, uh, the original image and it's still somewhat submissible in court. Um, there's also, I mean, if you get to the point where you're making a backup of this, you should probably buy a good enough tool to be able to do a lot of this automatically. 
um, and get around a lot of the shortcomings of the tools and have more options and more things you can do. Uh, anyone else? All right. Thanks for the double tap. Enjoy. <laughs>